Life is full of choices. Do I go left? Do I go right? Do I go up? Do I go down? Standing in front of the elevator. Do I eat this? Do I eat that? Do I say yes? Do I say no? Sometimes those choices are more complicated than just A or B. They're more diverse and, and numerous th than any, many, many, mo. Sometimes those choices are not just a matter of expediency or a matter of preferences. Frequently the choices that we face in life are a matter of right and wrong, good and bad, God and Satan, heaven and hell, saint or sinner. We face choices. And the choices that we face can have a lasting impact upon our lives. Some choices seem to have little to no impact whatsoever, especially in the moment and as a standalone choice. Do I eat Burger King or a salad? Or a salad from Burger King, which is just as bad as the Whopper. But do, I, do I make a routine of poor choices that as a pattern of behavior develop into stronger consequences? And then there are those choices... The choice to vent when I should have refrained. The choice to pursue when I should have restrained. The choice to enjoy when I should have retained. Those choices can have the sort of lasting consequences that can destroy relationships, lives, and eternity. We face choices, even this week. Now, the word is not choice as it's uh, proposed. The word is not decision as it's put forward. We use the word election. But it's about making a choice. When we look at our decision-making processes, we understand that life is full of choices. James hit on this idea when he would tell his audience, James 1 beginning in verse 13, Let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God. God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. When lust is conceived, it brings forth sin. Sin, when it's finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Err, planao. Wander. Don't choose the wrong road. Don't go astray. Do not pursue a different path than that God would have you to take. Life involves choices. Now, proper choices take wisdom, which James hit on that idea even earlier in James 1 when he said in verse 5, If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men liberally and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. Choices require wisdom. James said God gives wisdom, which by the way, this is a reflection of the wisdom from Proverbs. Proverbs 2, 6, the Lord giveth wisdom. Out of His mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. Question, when it comes time for those decisions that we know can have a lasting impact, some decisions we may not realize the impact they have, and we make them with the best information we have, but there are others. We know this is a major decision. Do we go to God about it? Uh, do we pursue God's wisdom whenever we're making those decisions about whether to pursue or retain, to enjoy or refrain, to, to vent or restrain? Do we pursue God's wisdom when we try to determine who's going to get my support, who's going to get my encouragement, who's going to get my backing? Are we pursuing God's wisdom when we face choices? Sometimes it helps to have a few notes. Sometimes it helps to have a, a series of tests, if you will, to consider. And there's a sense in which, working backward through James 1, there are some principles conveyed that can help us in our decision-making process. Consider, if you will, seven tests when making decisions. In any decision of life, seven tests. What test can help me to choose wisely? Well, first, there's going to be the innocence test. Does this decision or this, this choice regarding this decision 
pass the innocence test. What do we mean by the innocence test? Well, James would say, James 1, 13 through 17, as we've already noted, every man's tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and entice. It's my own pursuit. It's my own desire. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Everything good, the word translated good is agathos. It's that which is morally virtuous. This is the idea of that, that which is wholesome and good. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. It comes down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. There's no shadow cast because He turned His face away. Everything good's from God. Are we choosing the good? When faced with the decision, is it a good idea? James, at the close of this chapter, would say in verse 26, If any man among you seem to be religious, looks good, but bridleth not his tongue, deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain, looks good, but not quite. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is to visit the fatherless and widows and their affliction to keep himself unspotted from the world. The innocence test. This choice that I have before me, is it going to soil me and stain me? Am I casting my support? Am I putting my decision in that which is contrary to God's will? Is this going to soil my soul? We have to understand. Brethren, it's high time for us to lose some concepts that we have worked into our vocabulary. For instance, let's stop choosing the lesser of two evils. At no point in his life did Jesus ever choose evil. And at no point in our lives are we ever authorized to choose evil. Now there are times that we have to make choices between that which is uh, unwanted and undesirable or that which is immoral. There are times that we have to make decisions when we simply choose the greatest good. We're not choosing evil. Take, for instance, suppose you have two candidates, both of which hold an immoral position on, say, uh, alcohol and its accessibility, availability, and usage. Well, if they both hold an immoral decision and there, there are only two options, do I have a choice? Everyone do this. There's no choice to make. But if there's a distinguishing characteristic between those two individuals regarding another topic, another moral issue where one holds an immoral position and the other does not, there is a choice that can be made there. We're not choosing the lesser of two evils when there's no choice to make in a situation. Let's say that again. God never chose evil. Neither do we. We choose the greatest good to the best of our ability. We choose what is innocent and wholesome and right and true. Every time that we have an option between good and bad, we endeavor to choose what's good. That decision has to be an informed one. It's only by knowledge of God's will and God's word that we're going to have an understanding of what's good, which is why Paul would tell, the, the, tell Timothy, 2 Timothy 3, 16, all scriptures given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, complete, thoroughly furnished or fully equipped every good work. We're fully equipped to make the decisions we need to make. The question is, have we gone to the source to know how to approach those decisions? Paul would tell the Romans, Romans 12, 2, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Renewing of your mind, let your mind be changed. How? that you might prove, know by doing, that you might know from experience what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Well, where do I learn the will of God, God's Word? How does it become something that changes my mind? How do I know it by experience to the point that it becomes who I am and what I am? By practicing it, pursuing it. Which is why the Hebrews writer would say, Hebrews 5, 12 through 14, the strong meat is for those that are of full age who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. The more we apply His Word and put it to use, the more it changes who we are. 
the more it exercises our outlook on life and our decision-making process to where it's not a matter of, oh, what should I do, what should I do, but it becomes more natural to choose the right, to see the right, and to discern between right and wrong. This is the same epistle, the book of Hebrews, wherein the writer would say concerning God's will for His people and the law that they are to follow, that He would write His word on their hearts. Hebrews 8.10 a quote from Jeremiah, yes, but the point being this. It's not a matter of just some standard that, that we put off to the side and uh, double check it. It's a standard that's written on our hearts and therefore guides who we are. Well, if it's going to be written in our hearts, we're going to have to put it there. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Psalm 119, 11. But here's the question. Who's the author of what's written on your heart? Who's the author of the decisions that you'll make today? Who authored your decisions of yesterday? Does it pass the innocent test? The innocence test is going to be a reflection of that which is right and true in God's sight. Another test to utilize, does it pass the integrity test? Integrity, well integrity and innocence can go hand in hand, yes. But consider the use of the word integrity as it is going to relate to consistency. We back up to James 1, 26. We noted it a moment ago. Here's a man that seems to be religious, or at least ceremonially, outwardly religious, but he bridleth not his tongue. He ain't got no control over what comes out of his mouth. Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. And the one that bridleth not his tongue is the one that has not bridled his heart. Why? Because he's not surrendered it to God. If any man among you seem to be religious, but bridleth not his tongue, deceiveth his own self, this man's religion is vain. Do our decisions pass the integrity test when it comes to what we say and how we say it? Anyone ever said the right thing the wrong way? Or the wrong thing the wrong way? Sometimes those are a matter of momentary lapses. Sometimes those are a matter of deliberate faults. Are we bridling our tongues? Our tongues reflect what's in the heart as much of our action, as our actions do. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he, Proverbs 23. Our actions are indeed a reflection of who we are and how we think. Do we think with integrity? Are we consistent in our actions and what we endeavor to show people outwardly? Whereas James highlights the disparity between an individual's actions and words when they're inconsistent, our actions and words can be consistent when they're coming from a pure heart, a pure mindset. Paul would encourage brethren as it pertained to, to peace and calmness and contentment. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, honest, that is honorable, just, pure, lovely, of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. What kind of decisions do we make when we're all the time focused on negatives? What kind of behavior do we exhibit in interacting with others when we're all the time looking at a pessimistic outlook on life? All the time focusing on what's wrong with everyone else or what's not comfortable with me. What kind of decisions do we tend to make when we're looking at positives? When we're truly focused on what's true. When we are rightly focused on what's just. And when we are respectably focused on that which is honorable. Whatsoever things are true, honorable, just, pure, lovely and of good report. When we get our minds in the right places, we tend to make better decisions. So does it pass the integrity test? Is it consistent with whom I'm endeavoring to be and exhibit myself as being? Paul would tell the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 8, 21, to provide things honest or that is honorable in the sight of not only God but men as well. Which brings us to our next thought. 
Does it pass the innocence test, the integrity test, and does it pass the influence test? Because if I'm going to provide that which is honorable, respectable, proper and upright in the sight of men, then I'm going to be thinking about the example that I set. James 1, 26. He seems to be religious, but he doesn't bridle his tongue. His religion is vain. In fact, the one that behaves that way is having a negative impact on the observers around him that see here, this is one that claims to be of Christ and his actions are as crooked as a politician's, the bad ones. Romans 14, Paul made the point as he was discussing matters of conscience that no man lives to himself, no man dies to himself. Our lives are not lived on an island. You are not Tom Hanks, this is not cast away. There are people around you in life that see you. They see your actions. They see your behaviors. And no, I, as an observer of your life, do not know every circumstance, every criteria, or every situation in the scenario that might contribute to your thought processes and why you made some of the decisions that you make. Which is why low, loathe be the day that, that I start second-guessing the decisions of others based on my limited knowledge of what their situation is. At the same time, I need to loathe the day that my decisions are an exhibition of inconsistency, contradiction in the eyes of those that I'm, I claim to be trying to lead to Jesus. Does it pass the influence test? The story is told of a deacon who received a call from a person. That he was trying to study with this individual and lead him to Christ. And the man called and he said, I've, I've messed up again. I, I'm, I'm, I'm down at Smiley's, the, the local bar. I need to ride home. So the deacon got in his vehicle and he, and he went to give the man a ride home. Wait a minute. He shouldn't have his truck parked in the parking lot. People are going to see that and assume the worst. I can't help what the pessimists and the negativists assume. Now, I'm not going to park my truck down at Smiley's and leave it there all day while I hit to ride with somebody else to work. That's probably just not prudent. But when that deacon is going down to, to do a proper service, leave a proper influence, he can't be worried about what some folks are going to assume, especially with those that are always primed and prone to assume the worst. So when we talk about does it pass the influence test, we're talking about a proper, reasonable, exhibited example influence. We're not talking about the 1% oh, the, the chance maybes. We're talking about am I setting the proper influence. You know, every now and then, the influence might need to be explained. That's okay. And then every now and then, the influence might need a bit of explanation, but we also real, have to realize there are some folks that just don't deserve one. Does it pass the influence test? Am I doing what is ultimately wholesome, right, and setting the right example for those that need led to Christ? Think about the way Paul put it when he wrote to Timothy. 1 Timothy 4.12 let no man despise thy youth, but Timothy, you be an example to the believers. And you be an example of what a believer is, but you be thou an example of the believers in word, what you say, conversation, how you act. Word, conversation, charity, how you treat other people. Spirit, your attitude. Faith, your relationship with God. Purity, your overall cleanness. That's a pretty good description of every aspect of life. And the way I treat folks in every direction. The saved and the lost. The good and the bad. Does it pass the innocence test? Does it pass the integrity test? Does it pass the influence test? Another test to consider. Does it pass the improvement test? James 1 Picking up at verse 21 and moving forward. Lay aside all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. Receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. 
Be ye doers of the word, not, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. If anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man beholding his natural face in the glass. He beholds himself, he goes his way, uh, beholds what manner he is, and goes his way and straightway forgets what manner of man that he is. Why do we use mirrors? Just to look and see exactly how we look for better, for worse, and head out and let everybody see it? Or when we look in the mirror, do we often look for things to improve and adjust? When's the last time you looked in the mirror and didn't try to tweak something? When's the last time you looked in the mirror and thought, oh, my eyebrows are out of place? My wife tells me that I've got tarantulas growing over my eyes. My eyebrows are out of place. It's the only hair I've got. Everything else is gone. <laughs> you look in a mirror and, and you do an assessment. Physically speaking, we look for things that might need improved or adjusted so that we present ourselves as best possible. Whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. We look in the mirror of God's Word with the mindset, not only what does God say, but what does God say about how I can be better? Does it pass the improvement test? This decision that I'm facing, that I'm making, is it going to help me get to heaven? Or is it going to create obstacles on my road to to eternity with God. This decision that I'm making, is it going to strengthen my relationship with Christ or is it going to be something that separates me from Him? This decision that I'm making, is it going to make me a better person? Is it going to help me be stronger? Is it going to help me be more experienced in that which is right? Is it going to help me with my influence? Yes, but with my very identity. That means that frequently the decisions we make are not going to be the ones that are the path of least resistance. The decisions that we make are, are not going to be pursuing the options that just seem best for the now or the short term. We'll be making decisions that involve sacrifice, that involve waiting, instant gratification, if that's the decision-making process, then the, the improvement test isn't really there. 1 Corinthians 10, 23, Paul would make the point that all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Sure, there may be behaviors and conducts and areas of activity in which I can engage, but are they going to make me better? Not everything is simply a matter of right and wrong, but some things are going to be a matter of prudence. Is it going to help me edify others? And is it really going to edify me in the way that it's strengthening my soul, making me better? That requires challenging self instead of complacency. Does it pass the innocence test, the integrity test, the influence test, the improvement test? And does it pass the independence test? Before James would say, let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God, he would actually make the point springing from another line of thinking that blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he's tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord, the righteous judge, has promised to them uh, that love him. There's a crown that awaits. That crown is for those that endure. But for those that surrender to the, the temptation, whether it be the hardship temptation, as is discussed in the first part of James chapter 1, or the moral temptation, if you will, as discussed beginning in James 1.13. Let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God. God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted he any man. Every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust, his own desires. Whatever the nature of the temptation, am I letting it overcome me? Am I surrendering to it? Paul would put it this way. A passage that conveys some similar thoughts to 1 Corinthians 10, 23, but this one does diverge a bit. 1 Corinthians 6, 12, all things are lawful for me, all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. 
We call that addiction. The person brought under the power of something else, addiction. There are those that are addicted to sensuality. There are those that are addicted to alcohol and intoxication. There are those that are addicted to their narcotics or their nicotine. There are those that are addicted to the mirror. There are those that are addicted to their spending habits or their gambling. It's been said that there are over 2,000 classified addictions. It's worth considering, brethren, that any activity in life that can possibly gain more interest and, and uh, focus from us than our relationship with God is a potential category of addiction. Thus, there are far more than 2,000 categories of addiction. Anything can be addictive. There are some folks addicted to the grandbabies to the point they let them come between them and God. There are some folks addicted to the children's sports. There are some folks that are addicted to their children's grades. And as long as they pass the, uh, the intellect test, we're not worried about the innocence test or the influence test or the integrity test or the improvement test or the independence test. Hmm. What about this independence test? Is it controlling me? Every addiction, no matter what it is, is ultimately a manifestation of selfishness. It's all about me. Instead of putting my wants, wishes, and desires, my lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and pride of life to the side, and pursuing God's way. The independence test. Am I pursuing an area of activity, whether inherently moral or not, Am I allowing this to gain control of me? Another test to take. The investment test. Is it a wise use of my time? You might put it that way. James would say, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. Paul would tell the brethren, Ephesians 5, beginning in verse 15, See that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time for the days of evil, our evil. If we're going to walk in wisdom, that means we're going to make the most of our time. We're going to utilize our time in a way that reflects our relationship with God, that spends each minute in a manner commiserate for what it means to be a Christian. Be not, uh, Paul would actually say we can know what the will of the Lord is, Ephesians 5, 17. We can know God's will. And we can live it minute to minute, hour to hour, day to day. So is this decision a proper investment of my time or my resources or my energy? Does it pass the investment test? Oh, please understand, there's a time to relax. There's a time to, to sit back and, and enjoy the moment. Even Jesus would tell His disciples, Come ye apart and rest for a while. Rest is not in and of itself a waste of time. Matter of fact, there are times that it is exactly what the doctor ordered. <laughs> but you know, some folks can get addicted to rest too. It's called slothfulness, laziness. See the book of Proverbs. Our point here is this. When we talk about the investment test, is it a proper investment of my time? Is it spending the time and the energy to, to focus on what's actually needed? Or is it in some way more of a, a haphazard waste? Does it pass the innocence test? Is it good? Does it pass the integrity test? Is it consistent? Does it pass the influence test? Is it going to help me lead others to Jesus? Does it pass the improvement test? Is it going to make me better? Does it pass the investment test? Is it a proper use of time? The independence test? Is it going to overcome me? You know, if there's no other question, let's think about this one. Because James would introduce this very epistle by saying, James, the servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm just a servant, he said. Jesus would make the point, that the disciple is not above his master, the servant is not above his Lord, but it is enough for the disciple that he be as his master. James introduced this very chapter by declaring himself not to be the half-brother of Jesus, but the servant of Jesus. And the servant wants to be like his Savior. Does it pass the imitation test? Remember those bracelets? WWJD? What would Jesus do? 
we might be better served at say WDJD. What did Jesus do? Because every time he faced the temptation, he answered it with, it is written. And when he didn't use what God had said, then he approached the temptation by talking to God. Let there be no doubt, Gethsemane was a moment of trial and temptation. And he went to God in prayer. Here's the imitation test. Am I looking for what is written as it pertains to the decision? So that I can by practice, have my senses to discern, uh, train to discern both good and evil? And am I going to God in prayer, petitioning wisdom, petitioning clarity, petitioning God and His providence to help me see what needs to be seen? And when as much information as theirs can be gathered, when the decision has to be made, am I truly approaching it from the matter of if Jesus were in my shoes, what decision would He make? Well, Jesus was never a husband in the way that I am. Then what decision does His Word tell you to make? Jesus was never a, a, a woman. What decision does His counsel, guidance, attitude, do His principles tell you to make? If no other test, consider the imitation test. As a matter of fact, that's the turning point in life. Because those that would follow Jesus know of not only the life He lived, but the death He died and the resurrection that He accomplished. By the way, that's the gospel message, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 8. And He left proof of it. Those that would have a life lived with Jesus and truly be imitating Him are the ones that have, because of what He did, are willing to say, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Their confession demonstrates their belief. And they, they not only say, but they exhibit repentance, which is unto salvation, 2 Corinthians 7.10. They decide to live differently, and they bury that old person. As many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death. We've imitated Him. That like as Jesus Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, we also walk in newness of life. Have you started pursuing the imitation test? Have you been washed in His blood? Crucified with Christ? Have you died with Him so that you can live for Him? Whatever the case may be this morning, perhaps you're a child of God and your decisions have been ill-suited for a saint. Perhaps you're not a child of God and it's time to make the greatest decision of your life. Consider the innocence, the, the, the integrity, the influence. Yes, consider the, the improvement question. And ultimately, consider the imitation. And if it's time to follow in the steps of Jesus, why not come forward while we stand and while we sing?